Pants on Tap. Uh, how many folks, it seems like there's a lot of new faces here. How many folks have not been to a Science on Tap before? That's a good chunk of folks. That's really good to see. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program so you know uh, why you're here, I guess. Uh, Science on Tap is a, a cooperative. It's, it's uh, brought to you by the Flathead Lake Biological Station, the Flathead Lakers, and the brewing company here. And it's essentially an opportunity for people who use science in their work and people who do research and, and use science in, in a meaningful and productive way to come and talk about how they do that. Um, we've had a lot of different types of speakers over the, over the I guess, almost two and a half years now that we've been doing it. Um, tonight is pretty special, I think, because we're going to talk a lot about a, a real-world problem that is very uh, near and dear and how science is used to sort of uh, mitigate that problem and how to be aware of that problem. And sometimes we have speakers that come in and talk about a pretty, um, you know, a pretty narrow perspective on some very fine detail that we're like last month when I spoke about my work in Antarctica, there's not really a, uh, it doesn't hit too close to home, but this one should. This one should grab everybody right by the ears, and, and we, should, we should listen carefully. Um, a couple uh, housekeeping uh, orders of business here. Every beer that gets bought from 5 to 8 tonight gives uh, the Lakers and the bio station a dollar to split, and that ends up uh, viewing a whole bunch of, of work that we get done, like this, the uh, Science on Tap website. Um, it offers sometimes when there's not 35 speakers an opportunity for dinner. Um, we, we try to treat the, the speakers that come in uh, well and, and, and make it worth their while. So so I guess we're drinking for cause but responsibly tonight. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you to the brewery for that. Uh, it's a really great gesture. Um, how many folks in here are Flathead Laker members? All right, that's a lot of people. It's really good to see. There's some debate up front if they're members or not. Uh, you're probably not then. If you have to think about it. <laughs> um, usually my wife is here to discuss uh, Lakers business. She is the education and outreach coordinator for the Flathead Lakers, Hillary. Uh, unfortunately, she's ill this evening. Um, uh, yeah. uh, rough, rough year for colds, I think. I think everybody knows that. Um, she, also, she lasted a while, but it took her took her now. So she's in she's in a rough rough shape. Um, but she's here in spirit, and she wanted me to tell you if you're not a Laker member, you should honestly consider joining the Lakers. And anybody who just raised their hand, would you put your hands up again, Lakers members? Do we have any board members? There we go. There's Betty. All right. You're hiding back there. If, uh, if you wouldn't mind, you could talk to Betty Moore about joining the Lakers if you're interested. They do a lot of amazing work uh, keeping the lake clean, educating about the threats of invasive mussels and other invasive species, and generally doing a good job educating why Flathead Lake is such an important part of our community. That's a good plug. You can tell Hillary I did well. Um, <laughs> one other thing that the Lakers and the bio station uh, have been working on a bit that I want to bring up tonight. This is sort of the unveiling, but it's to a good group of folks. Is we're working on a citizen science program. There's an organization out there. I don't know if organization is the right word. There is a um, project, we'll call it, that looks all over the country at secchi disc deaths. Anybody here want to venture what a secchi disc death is? Tom Bansack, assistant director of the Flathead Box Station, raises his hand. Um, anybody else? Oh. It's a little disc. It's black and white quadrants lowered into the water. Exactly. That was about the best definition you can get. It's a disc that offers a pretty vivid coloration that you drop down and you can see how clear your water is. There's a thing called the Great Seki Dip-In and it takes place in July across the country and essentially what it is is it's a chance for folks to go out and take some water quality measurements as part of a bigger sort of crowdsourced effort to examine water quality across the nation. And Flathead Lake doesn't really register on this uh, national database, so I hope to change that, and the Lakers hope to change that, with a 
uh, a citizen science initiative where um, for a nominal fee and the participation cost, you get a second disc and you get to go out to your favorite place on Flathead Lake and measure water for clarity. Um, and then report the data either back to us or straight to this bigger organization. There's a website out there. It's the great Flathead Dippin, I believe, something like that. If you search for that, it'll come up. Um, but there's some information. We're going to start pestering all of you that are on our mailing list about joining up because it's uh, an opportunity for me to learn more about water clarity around Flathead Lake, of which we don't know very much. And it gives us a chance to sort of look at a spatial dynamic that would not be possible otherwise. Um, and that will be uh, coming at you through all sorts of social media and email blasts. So please look for it and please consider uh, participating. Any other things? Oh, Science on Tap is real relaxed. We've got new folks here. You have to understand this is a, a, a crowded room, but we all need beer, right? So if you need a beer, there we go. Hey, I need a beer. That's all you got to do. Just give them a little nod, give them a wave, a mouth, what kind of beer you want. Take what you get, I suppose. Um, and, and we'll work on, hey, work on the sort of apologies after the fact, right? Um, I think we've got a, a, a power panel tonight. We've got a, a lot to get through. I'm going to say up front, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves as they come up. Speakers, can you take the deal? Yep. All right, and we're going to get through, we're going to talk about fire in Northwest Montana. I'd ask you all to hold your questions. We're going to have a long Q&A at the end of all of this, but we've got so much to get through that I worry if we take questions along the way, we'll stagger on and, and you'll have too many beers and then we'll get messy. So, um, I, I guess I'd like to give a round of applause to our panel tonight. We have some great experts. Thank you very much. Like Sean said, thank you all for being here this evening. This is, uh, I think, wildfire is a topic on everybody's mind these days as we're entering another fire season. Um, we do have a bunch of people here this evening. We're going to start off with a little bit of fire history in the big, in the greater Big Fork area, and that's going to be Rick Trembath. Rick Trembath is a, a student of fire. I think he started on the Flathead Hot Shot Crew in the 70s. He's been involved with fire ever since. On um, teams, he teaches wildfire classes at the FEC. He's, in, he's been engaged all up until last season, and I'm sure he will be this season as well. So we're breaking it up into about 20-minute sections. There'll be a little bit of a break in between. I'm going to follow up. My name is Allie Onwelling, and I do fire wildfire prevention and education. Thank you. <laughs> wildfire prevention, education, and information for the DNRC here in Kalispell. Uh, and then... After me, we are going to invite uh, the Swan District of the Flathead National Forest. So these are your neighbors right across the road. We have the Fire Management Officer, Brent Olson. We have the Assistant Fire Management Officer of Operations, Brett Parkman. And we have the Assistant Fire Management Officer of Fuels, Jake Jerasek. So I want you to know that we work together, we talk to each other, this is interagency, this is cooperative. This is how wildfire is in the Flathead Valley. Uh, and we're going to start it off with Rick. Here you go. Okay, so um, I'm going to start it off with uh, what fire was all about on the landscape around here historically. You can see a little fire there up to the left and a big fire to the right. And uh, we've had a lot of fire in between that. So let's see if I can advance. So the Native I'll get the hang of this. The Native Americans uh, is where we have to go back to. Um, pre European influence because for centuries the Native Americans, the indigenous people, influenced significantly the amount of fire and the kind of fire on our landscape. This clicker isn't working very good. So the Confederated Salish Kootenai tribe just south of us has done an awful lot of uh, historical knowledge, traditional knowledge populations, and uh, they, they really did use fire significantly for food production, animal management, travel, making travel easier, and, and a, a myriad of other um, uses. They're still using fire. Um, they're still doing burning, and, uh, but not to the extent that they used to. So that's kind of an interesting thing. So some of the uses for mushrooms, for uh, huckleberry production, for camas fall production, for food and substance, they, they burned a lot. So if you want more information about that, the Confederated Sailor 
Heritage Foodie website has a, a, a really good um, portrayal of what that was all about. And on the bottom of that, that last sentence, in many areas the tribal people more than doubled the frequency of natural lightning fire. So there was no suppression of fire with the indigenous youth people. They didn't suppress any wild wildfires like we do today. In, in, in fact, they lit a lot more uh, fire in the landscape. So the first, uh, the first scientific, so to speak, uh, study of this area was in conjunction with the U.S. Geological Survey um, in the late 1800s. And the Flathead Forest Reserve and the Lewis and Clark Forest Reserve were what were, were examined. And it took a whole year for each one of those by an individual riding around on a horse, looking at the land, writing down what his observations were, and trying to understand uh, what was going on. But some of the observations are very different than what you might expect. There was a lot of fire that had just uh, gone through the landscapes. So here east of Whitefish above the lake, that big, 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 big mountain, eight square miles have been burned over recently. And all of those fires are were the severe sand replacement fires. They weren't the little fires here in the valley bottom, but uh, in the last 25 years. So these are pictures taken from 1889 in the Flathead Valley, Swan Valley, and this is the portrayal of what our valleys used to look like. They were big, large trees, a large and ponderosa pine with almost no brush underneath them, mostly grass, and uh, that was because there was a lot of light uh, intensity fire. In the Lewis and Clark Reserve Survey, notice Big Fork between Big Fork and Yellow Bay, and way down there to the right, the indication is, is that that is, whole area has been recently burned within the last 25 years. So, um, you know, only areas recently burned or those overrun by fire within the last 40 years have been shown on the map. So, um, it suggests that we had a lot of fire use on the land and it was probably by the indigenous peoples to um, better themselves with their horse use and, uh, and grazing. Let me back up here. But um, the estimation by the researcher was uh, that 1,420 square miles, or about a third of the reserve, had been recently burned. So the reserve was about 3 million acres, so that would have been uh, uh, about a million acres had been burned in the last 25 years or so. And some pictures more out there by Holland Lake and down in the valley bottom. All of those pictures show this kind of an environment. So down by Seely Lake, there's a recently restored large um, habitat type down there. Um, the, the Tim Love, the, the ranger down there, they all do, but anyway, that has the world's largest large. And uh, the reason that it is still thriving is because it can withstand fire. It's got about maybe six to eight inches of bark, and uh, it'll take fire very, very well. But not real intense fire. If that had all been crowded by conifers uh, or fir trees, then it would have killed that tree. So we read we, about a lot of different things here. Um, just a lot of, lot of fire. The historic evidence around Big Fork, which is still there, shows this large stump um, having a tremendous fire history. That's out there by Swan River School on the Lake Trail. And all of those little arrows indicate a fire frequency or a fire event of low intensity fire. Similarly, just in back of us up here on Chapman Hill, there's a ponderosa pine stump that shows the same thing. In there, do you see all those arrows? Those are individual fire events, and there hasn't been a fire in either one of those places probably for the last hundred years. And uh, the, you know, the ground has changed to uh, being 
So this is historic. Oops.
substation in 1902, and uh, that's 110 years later, and today, what it looks like. Uh, in 1965, we still had sparse trees on a lot of Averill's Ranch subdivision uh, area up there.
down towards Summers Bay at the Lakeside area in 34, but the Lakeside wasn't there. That's the same picture. Um, we had our district ranger here on the Swan Lake District killed by a snag on a patrol bird in uh, 1953. Um, I just want to show this. We had lots of fires in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Oh. 
those lightning strikes in the spring, the summer, how, how fire used to just move across the landscape and burn. No boundaries, no structures, no roads, no power lines. It would go out when it ran out of fuel. It would go out when the weather changed. That's, that's the environment that we have, have chosen to live in, right? So we know that the, the western larch that Rick made reference to, the Douglas fir, the ponderosa pine, the lodgepole, these are all forest trees that have adapted with fire. All right, so what's happened? Rick alluded to suppression. And this is really, really very generalized. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, we've been, we've been putting out fires and we have an accumulation of forest fuels out there. These are factors influencing the, the position we find ourselves in today. We are in a changing climate. And like Rick just said, we may have had decades of sort of those cooler, wetter years. And now we're sort of in this swing where conditions are a little, a little hotter, a little drier, and we're seeing Fire managers are seeing longer fire seasons, more intense uh, conditions. So it is cyclical, but we are trending towards longer fire seasons and more large fires. What else do we have? Well, we have us. Yeah? Look at these folks. They're picking out their spot. It's wonderful. Let's build our home right here. A bunch of matchsticks. Again, very generally speaking. Also, wildfire moves a lot faster than you think sometimes. I think when we think about fire, if anybody looked at the map last season and you saw fires all around us, right? But we didn't have anything really big going on in that Kalispell, Kalispell Flathead area. Only we do have, we have a lot of initial attack and we have a lot of small fires that are caught. We, the, the, the grasses of last fall that were super dry, brown, cured out, sat under snow all winter. What happens? The snow melts, the sun comes out, there's a little bit of wind, they dry up again, they're still dry. So we have our grass fire season in the spring before Greenham. And what happens? Over in Creston, somebody's doing a good job, they're debris burning, the wind picks up. So this is a small fire, but it's a grass fire. It's moving quickly, and now it's threatening structures. So it's not necessarily that large fire that is going to destroy your home. Um, but what we need to be concerned about are those small fires as well. Okay, so very, very briefly, okay. Very, very briefly, the fire behavior trend. So when we're talking about fire behavior and what produces conditions that would create uh, large fires, um, we're looking at fuels, weather, and topography. And Rick alluded to this in his presentation. So when we're talking about fuels, we're talking about fuel loading. We're talking about continuity, both horizontally and vertically on the landscape. How continuous are those fuels? What's the moisture of those fuels? What are we, what are we looking at? And when we say fuels, you know we're talking grass, brush, timber. When we talk wildland fires, we're not talking forest fires. We're talking grass and brush and timber. We're also looking at weather. So, Rick said, most of our weather comes from the southwest. All right, those are our winds. Weather encompasses humidity, encompasses our temperatures. It's what's happening on a daily basis. It's what's happening on a seasonal basis. And then we also have topography. So, like his last shide slope showed, you know, we're looking at slopes, we're looking at drainages, we're looking at uh, north-facing slopes that get a little bit more, a little less sun, a little less drying, different fuels, different forest types, generally speaking. So when we look at these things and we put them in alignment, so we have really dry fuels, and we have some really low humidities and some high temperatures, and now we've got some steep slopes or some drainages that funnel that weather, that those winds, that's, that's what we're looking at. That's when we have maybe a red flag warning. Does anybody know what a red flag warning is? Okay, good. 
So that would be it. That would be sort of when these conditions, not all these conditions, but when, when we have a weather event coming through. Yes? Yes. Some sort of a weather event. So when you check your weather and it's and or you're listening to the radio and they say red flag today, that's what that means. There's the potential for fire growth. There's potential for fire. Any ignition, any spark off a dragging chain, any spark has the potential to become a, a large a fire. Speaking very generally. Alright, so forest structure. I like to cover this. I see two things here. Uh, I see what we call surface fuels down here on the ground. What we call ladder fuels. So fuels that allow a fire to travel from the ground into the crown of the trees. So generally speaking, that's our, our forest structure. And then I also see in this first picture, this might be now, you know, it's kind of wet. You know, we could have an ignition and it's not really, probably not going to do very much. Our firefighters are going to catch that fire pretty easily. You know, maybe it's June. Maybe it's July, maybe it's August, and now we have the same ignition, but now the fuel moistures are much lower, and that fire can grow bigger faster. So that's what I see. This is also why when we talk about managing forests, and we, we focus a lot on fuels, because this is the this is the only thing that we can really affect, right? The other thing is not all fire is the same. So if you, uh, where is the other one? Sorry. Um, well, we could. I think what we often see is this, right? That's what we see on the news. Those are the stories that are covered. It's flames. It's raging. It's it's newsworthy. It absolutely is. And it affects people. It really does. But a lot of our fires are small fires, grass fires, shrub fires. They're, they're caught. Um, but it also shows you how fires spread. Again, how we can how we can manage the fuels. Fires also spread by embers. So in addition to a fire just sort of burning across the landscape, each fire has embers and firebrands associated with it. So here we have here we have a column. Does that just go off? <laughs> I think. Is that it's it's out. Okay. Working on it. Oh you have it. Okay. Okay. Well that was that was okay. <laughs> so what we have here is a column. A large column. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's working on it. <laughs> So I think I, oh, okay, there we are again. So what we have, uh, fire spread, we have a column, right? And that column is, there's a lot of energy. There's a lot of energy, there's a lot of heat, and it is taking pieces of pine cone and branches and sticks, and it is lofting those up into the air. And now, say there's a wind, either a wind from weather or a wind generated by the fire itself, and it's launching those firebrands out ahead of the fire so you can see spot fires. Oftentimes a fire can grow very quickly because of spot fires. Especially in those conditions that we talked about when the fuels are really dry and any source of ignition is going to start a new fire. Um, it's also why when we make recommendations on what you do around your home and your property, that you are preparing for embers and firebrands. So Sean, this is a video. Sean? Okay, hit the picture on the left, please. So there's a hyperlink to a video. This is a lab setting. So uh, there's the Institute of Business of Home for Business and Home Safety, and they have a turntable where they build a structure and they build it of different materials, and then they have an ember generator where they just shovel in mulch and they fire embers at this structure and they say, okay, well, what material burns? What size screen do we need to keep those embers out? What kind of landscaping around the home is best? And if we don't have a video, that's fine too. Um, so that's the picture.
picture on the left. On the right is uh, it was a fire up in Canada a couple years ago, that one? Fort McMurray. So somebody's evacuating in Fort McMurray. And it's simply to show this is a lab setting and this is a real world setting. So they're not they're not exaggerating. So that's something that we really need to consider when we're looking at that space around our home and on our property. <laughs>
thinned out the trees, have some hardscaping. So again, knowing what you know about embers, knowing what you know about how homes can ignite, having some rock and some stone around your home is probably a good idea. Yeah. Some irrigation, and then some outdoor, outdoor entertaining space, a nice stone patio, some rock steps. So just a few concepts. All right, shifting gears, we're looking outside that home ignition zone. Again, you've got acres, and now you're thinking, how do I manage my forest? I just want to say that the DNRC, I work with and for a, a service forester, and his job is to serve you. So you've got questions about your forest, and he is available, call him up, um, to take a look and start putting together a management plan, identifying insects and disease, because we think that when we are recommending selectively removing fuel around your place, let's start with some insects and disease and some forest health. Let's talk about how you want to manage your forest. So these are examples again from this Big Fork area, Blue Bear State Park. Um, you know, we just went for a walk the other day and we noticed, wow, these trees are absolutely debarked. What is going on here? Have you guys been down there? Have you seen this around here? So it's a flat-headed wood borer. So he gets all this axe and he takes off a little bark and he does a little diagnosis and sure enough, the flat-headed wood borer. So anyway, if you've got some property and some trees and you're curious about what's going on, that's rich. We also have the Northwest Montana Hazardous Fuels Program and these folks have the cost share funding available to help you do some thinning around your home and property. 75, 25 cost share right now. So you're looking to treat some fuels, you want to fire, find a contractor, contact these folks and they can help you through that process. So usually the three to five acres around your building or the access and egress getting in and out of your property. 